All right. So um, I know we're Finnish, but we're not finished. Um, and that's a bad joke. Uh, what I was, was hoping, and most of you, how many of you know Reddit and AMA? Ask me anything panels. All right. So we've got three folks up here who are um, one who is a, a pseudo um, gamer, game refinery on his off time um, doing work at Game Refinery, but also a Red Hatter. So there's a little expertise here beyond um, just production use as well. But you, this is your opportunity to ask them anything about their current um, production, their future, and all of that. And, and I know, so I have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask after listening to their talks today. And the first one for Auntie. Mm? Um, it's not Auntie like Auntie. Okay. Auntie. Auntie? Yeah. Okay, Auntie. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's in the application stack under SON? The, um, so what are you, you, you want to recruit people. So you know, what cool technology are you trying to run there to do all that AI and machine the, learning? The AI stuff is actually mostly Python. So, oh. so it's <laughs> rather simple stack. We try to keep, or we have discovered that the simpler your containers are, the more kind of scalable they are. Mm -hmm. and, and it's Python and TensorFlow so for the machine learning stuff. So have you looked at the, the kubeflow images? We have been uh, investigating, and I was really uh, <laughs> happy to hear that they are becoming part of OpenShift, possibly in the future. Yep. That was, I think, in OpenShift, Op OpenShift or Red Hat Summit in, in San Francisco yep. was some, so some talk about that. We've made a number of plans. If those of you who don't know kubeflow, um, the TensorFlow community, along with the Kubernetes community, have created another open source pro upstream project to make TensorFlow and other, um, not just TensorFlow, but other things run very nicely for the ML stacks. Um, there is, as I always say, an OpenShift machine learning um, group, uh, special interest group, and David Aronchek from Google and Matt Farley from Red Hat um, co-chair that. And you'll be happy to know that Kubeflow is um, first class now, and you can run it on OpenShift. Can I have or a question? Go ask a question. How many developers do you have? In total? In total. Or, uh, it's something around uh, 120, I guess. Okay. Oh, we jealous. Yeah. Yeah. Diane is so interested about Python because her Twitter handle is Python DJ. Yeah. Python DJ. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I have a bias. So, yeah, I'm going to, you know. We became best friends. Best friends <laughs> just now here. Um, but that also, for um, Arrow, one of the things that we were talking about um, after yours was one of your biggest challenges is finding resources. How big is your, the team that you're um, running with? Right, so is this on? Yeah, cool. Um, so our, like I mentioned, our IT is a total of 30 people just about, and um, the guy's doing OpenShift um, by a significant effort. Well, it's me and... Jenny over there, she's the ops guy, I'm the dev guy. So, two. Yeah, basically uh, two guys. So, since Antti did his shameless plug, I'm gonna do mine. <laughs> um, if you wanna do some cool stuff, then pick up the phone. <laughs> so, this is what happens at community events shameless recruitment, all right, which is quite okay. Um, but, but I think one of the things that um, you've just made this um, acquisition or merge with UC um, and I heard the word mainframe used. Um, there's going to be a lot of educational challenges and bringing people up to speed on what containers are. What What are your plans for you know trying to educate that whole crew of new new folks and convert them to cloud native container enthusiasts? Yeah, well, that's the question, isn't it? Um, well, let's put it this way: they're pretty tired of the whole mainframe thing themselves, so they're looking for for alternatives. And I think. Having the best solution is the is the first part, and then it's about I guess selling it to them as well. Um, we have to get our own stuff together properly first, and um, then we can roll out. But I can definitely say they've they've been interested because there's all these things I've been able to promise already. So uh, yeah, time will show, I guess. Yeah. So I'll put a shameless plug in for learning.openshift.com and the stuff that we're doing um, at Katakoda. Just please take advantage of that and people can learn. If there's any of these new topics, pretty much there's a 
a learning session with online um, access to deploying and testing with learn.openshift.com, which has been really good. And also um, MiniShift, if you haven't heard of that as well, um, is a great way to deploy OpenShift locally and get started and have some hands-on experience. Um, we're going to be hearing in the afternoon from Jeremy Brown about the Open Innovation Lab and some of the, the cool techniques they have for teaching as well. So that'll be good. Tara. I have a question again. Uh, Is there does. any questions in there? No. <laughs> you mentioned that you used a uh, hosted OpenShift from Ambiente and on-prem. What were the main differences between those two OpenShifts? Well, I mean... I don't think there was a huge difference. I mean, it was pretty easy because um, we um, actually uh, migrated the uh, testing environment for the GDPR service, and it was pretty painless actually to to get it running. So, I mean, I guess you have to be a little more careful with the ambiential one because if you um, if you make a route to your program, then it's in the internet. Um, with, with, uh, with with us, it's it's still uh, beyond one extra firewall. Cool. So I had one question for you, Tara. You keep asking questions, but um, you talk a lot about externalize everything or externalize as much as possible. What else is left to externalize? What what else would you like to be able to externalize um, for your game refinery uh, platform? One note first: we are also hiring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we not need to externalize anything, but. We can basically run whatever we want on OpenShift nowadays. Uh, maybe not functions yet, but the uh, mm, serverless functions will be in multi-tenant mode in OpenShift Online soon. But if we see that something is better run elsewhere, then we move it, like the MongoDB. We saw that we get the better performance, uh, it's easier to manage, we get, let's say, uh, like a new like, integration from there. We, we get a uh, better authentication on there. Then it's just for the business, it's better run elsewhere. It's not that there is a rule that you cannot run this on OpenShift. It's just what's the best way to do it, we just do it. Okay. So you're advising to externalize everything, but both of these guys um, have a lots of legacy, 1800s, 1902 or 1905. Is, you know, are you allowed to do do this sort of externalizing at Elisa or at... Um can I make a correction? I mean externalizing, uh, if there is a service that you can use, use it, don't build yourself. True. That's what I mean, externalizing. Yeah. yeah. Elisa is actually pretty good at building themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tero. <laughs> yeah. So are, are you able to take advantage and of externalized services yet? Uh, to or some extent, yeah. but obviously a telecom operator is quite... Um, interested in the data and it's actually regulated as well. So not all stuff can be externalized in yeah. the field. So both of you are in highly regulated industries too. So that really has some repercussions for what you're allowed to do. Uh, right, and for the um, Swedish credit information, for example, um, I can foresee it might be a problem to move their, uh, their stuff in, in Finnish um, servers. So, um, but uh, I'm not really familiar with the le legislation, so. We'll Don't worry, they'll, they'll get you up to speed fast. <laughs> yeah, It's just got to, you know, screw it up once and I'll know. Yeah, you'll know right away. All right. So are there any questions in the audience here? One way over here. My God, thank you. Yes. <laughs> if he doesn't have a Finnish accent, I'm going to have a... We need to have a swag for best questions. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, I'm Joaleno. I uh, have a question for Eero. How do you prioritize picking the applications that are um, redone into cloud-native environment. Do you pick the low-hanging fruits from the point of view that it is easy to uh, migrate into cloud-native, or do you want to have operator operati operations load pick up from, uh, taken up from the operators for them to focus on other things? Uh, yeah, so we've. Uh, I think we're going with um, generating more revenue, uh, like first. That's the. I think that's the arrowhead. Like, um, what what sort of new business can OpenShift um, give us, rather than going for the cost savings? Uh, that was the question, right? So, <clears throat> doing twenty four seven for some services will will bring that in, and um, being able to um, 
respond to heavy loads very quickly is probably something. Um, we've lost one or two, like a Stockman hulut päivät type of thing. Um, there would be a lot of credit checks coming in within one or two days, but currently we can't promise we can handle that load. So maybe once we can scale into cloud in, into an external cloud, cloud in real time, that'll be generating a lot of income for us. Cool. There are any other questions? There we go. Oh, God. We're getting them, We're getting them warmed up here. It's the ketchup bottle. So I'd like to ask um, what kind of a task it was to set up the on-premise OpenStack environment from, from the scratch? What kind of uh, hardware you have and any known pitfalls that you would like to tell about at this stage? How much time we have? Really? <laughs> we, oh, we got 15. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, pretty, pretty wide question, actually. Uh, <laughs> well... The task was rather difficult, yes. Uh, it's not... Uh, uh, well, maybe I should say that at first we even didn't run uh, any Red Hat version. We installed the community version. Uh, and, well, that took a lot of kind of understanding of what the components do and what they can use for and how they should be configured and lots of trial and error. Well, luckily, since we... Uh, have our own data centers, we have quite a good amount of hardware readily available, so it's not a big issue to set up some sort of cluster to do test installations or, or some such. So we ended up kind of, well, guessing a good setup of hardware that, that we could try on. Uh, well, we got it up and running, but pretty soon it was uh, kind of clear that the, maybe the supported version would work better for our environment because there would be a need for operations capability and, and yeah, well, the community version isn't well documented, so it's really hard to know what to do to ma maintain it and keep it running properly. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't have an estimate here that how long or how much time or how much effort it took, but I could say that it was significant. But actually, it, it was good to kind of do the exercise runs with the community edition, in my opinion. So now we have a couple of guys that are really skilled at, uh, well, maintaining, maintaining the cluster. So in that experience with OpenStack um, and using the community edition, uh, you mentioned um, that you had contributed uh, to the upstream in your talk about um, that, and I, I'm supposing that your experiences with OpenStack allowed you to contribute back to the OpenStack community feedback, probably on the lack of documentation or other things. But um, can you talk a little bit about, because you've also open, open sourced your um, load balancer integration with OpenShift, thank you very much, um, what it took for the cultural shift for Elisa to start working in open sh in the open source communities. Well, in my opinion, that's still a work in progress. So, so, <laughs> so, so n not all kind of are working with the open source model. We are trying towards it, and I guess the DevOps team is leading the way in that area because we work a lot with the open source technologies. So, so that way it became natural for us to kind of run or, or lead the way. Um, I should also, by the way, mention that we have contributed to, to Kubernetes and OpenShift as well. So we have collaborated with the upstream directly too. Yeah, and, that, and I think that's one of the points that I'm trying, trying to make um, as well is that um, it's not just OpenShift that we want you to do. You've contributed to OpenStack and to o Kubernetes and lots of other places and all of that gets fed into, you know, we, we all benefit from that. But I'm, I'm curious, culturally, like how you worked with management to get them to allow you to open source, say, your load, the, the steps that you had to take, maybe <laughs> legal and convincing management that this was a good thing to release this code into the wild. Was that an issue for you at Elisa? Well, not really. <laughs> I am the management, and as I, as, as I said, I, I, I work with uh, uh, kernel development already, so I'm pretty familiar with open source development myself. So there wasn't really too much convincing to do yeah. to, my, <laughs> on my, to my direction. So. Yeah. So, um, so I get to work with 
all different market sectors, and not all, all of them are Linux kernel developers. <laughs> and so in highly regulated industries like finance or banking and stuff like that, there's a lot of um, issues in terms of them being allowed to disclose what they're working on and pieces. Do you have, have you been contributing back, um, um, Arrow? Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't. Is there a cultural issue or a legal issue of, of why, or is, is there any reason, any barriers for you to contribute other than lack of opportunity? Uh, no, I think um, we've been busy um, getting things running and um, didn't didn't have the time to focus on you know the other stuff yet. Okay, we'll get you there. We'll get you there. It's uh, the, yeah, actually, the Finnish culture is. Like you said here, it's mm -hmm. difficult to get questions, so people may be a bit shy to do their contributions also. So that may require some encouragement. Yeah, and, and this is me encouraging you. But I'm also going to say that contributions come in lots of forms. Your questions are contributions, your stories are contributions, documentation support, changing, you know, grammar checking, all kinds of ways you can contribute back to communities. It's not just um, code contributions or open sourcing projects. So I really encourage you to, to think about when you're, um, you're worried about whether you're making a code contribution or you're going to be a committer or something like that. Make smaller steps. Um, your feedback is really one of the biggest contributions you can give to any community, whether it's OpenShift, Kubernetes, OpenStack, or any of the myriad of other tools that you probably are using. So is there another question in the audience? Oh my goodness, you guys. All right, there you go. Yes. <laughs> I, get ah, weekly I know, we're going to make everybody run around here a little bit. So question, so question actually to Antje about the Lisa clusters. So how much uh, you using the, like the normal workload compared to uh, workload which needs to be optimized for the hardware? So like high packet network transmission or uh, I don't know some hardware accelerators or some like protected from noisy neighbors. And uh, in overall, how much of your clusters are on top of uh, OpenStack and how much are uh, uh, bare metal? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, well, let's start with the one that is easier for me to answer. So all of the clusters on, on top of OpenStack. And that also sets some boundaries at the hardware accelerations, that technologies that we can use. So we generally don't do those as much. Uh, we have been looking into GPU processing for the AI training cycles, uh, but that's not done in production yet, but it's been planned. Uh, but that's pretty much it. We do have a separate uh, cloud environment for the telco uh, stuff that's more like networking heavy or uh, needs certain latency requirements. Uh, and that's probably, I think it's using DPDK for the acceleration, but I'm not too uh, familiar with the technology that it's running on currently. So I'm, I'm just, I feel like I'm adding all the bookmarks here. Um, so if you're looking up to, uh, for information about OpenShift on OpenStack on bare metal, there's um, a great number of um, blog posts and videos um, and briefings by um, a gentleman from Red Hat called Jeremy Eder, E-D-E-R. Um, he's done some great work on um, performance and Ramon Alvarez from the OpenStack team at Red Hat does, has a great briefing on the OpenShift Commons briefings, um, which is again on YouTube at RH OpenShift. Um, if you Google either of their names, um, you'll find lots of information on um, the bare metal um, question that you've asked. I'm not the expert on it, but anyway. So Taro, you've got a day job. Yep. It's at Red Hat. We know he's a Red Hatter. Um, how do you manage um, switching gears between your day job and the game refinery in the evening? And, and where do you find time to do all of that? I travel a lot because of I'm a Red Hatter. Yeah. So during the hotel, during the evenings, from basically from 9 to 5, I don't touch the game refiner at all. I might get some Slack messages, but then after uh, I spent night uh, evening at the hotel, then I concentrate on that. But how big is the team that's actually behind Game Refinery? Uh, there is 
two front-end developers, one full-time back-end developer plus me, not doing that much, and then some management and uh, then ish analyze, analyzer who actually play the mobile games and analyze the games. So about 15. 15 people. So it's interesting because what we have up here is we have an OpenStack open shifter, we have an online open shifter, and we have an on-prem open shifter. Um, and we have almost like, is, none of you are using dedicated yet. Okay, so we've pretty much got one of each of the, the variations that you could think about um, of deploying OpenShift on. And I'm wondering, um, from your perspective, because you're such a smaller thing, the benefits of running um, on OpenShift online um, and having that operations team behind you, how that's played out for you? I would say that it makes things a lot easier. I know that because of my day job, I know what it needs to manage an OpenShift. So we don't have time for that. And we, since we started from the day one, we started from OpenShift. So we don't have any requirements that we need our own OpenShift. We need uh, cluster admin rights. We are happy with the sandbox that we have. So we are not even thinking about having our own cluster because we don't basically have ops. We don't. We just deploy containers around the application, so it's a no-brainer for us to run the on, on, online. So, are any of you doing um, hybrid deployments? So, running some on-prem and some. You talked a little bit about externalizing um, at your company. Yeah, right. We're we're looking at that at the moment, but so far it's it's um, on on premise. We have this philosophy of doing stuff on premise. Perhaps it's due to some legislation or. or or something like that, but but yeah, we've definitely spoken about um, moving workloads to um, an external cloud as well. All right, cool. All right. Any other questions from the audience? All right, one in the way back there. All right, it's always on the opposite side from where the <laughs> microphone person is. Yeah, I, I uh, bet they're coordinating. <laughs> yes. So if you could Thanks just if you could just up. pause pause for one second before you ask your question, um, a woman just walked in the back of the room who we have to say thank you to before she takes off and goes and organizes another one. Tanya Ripo here is has been the main organizer behind this whole day um, for the past three months while you are all on vacation. Let me just tell you, Finns take vacations, but Tanya, really thank you very much. Before you take off, thank you. All right. So please, your question. Question to Antti and Elisa. Are you considering running this hybrid cloud like OpenStack and OpenShift together or have any idea of that? Uh, together? Or, uh, yes. Well, our OpenShift is installed on top of OpenStack okay. uh, and some workloads do actually run on OpenStack alone. So we don't run them in OpenShift. That's basically because we started with the OpenStack uh, only version and OpenShift came along later. So some workloads were set up in OpenStack and we haven't migrated or don't see the need to migrate everything onto OpenShift. Okay, that's, thanks. Cool. All right. Are there any more questions? There should be one in the front because we Carol, make is in back. <laughs> Carol is in back. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank our um, three. Oh, 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 one more. Oh, I, oh, my God. They're waking up. The Finns. <laughs> this is wonderful. I love this. You're breaking a cultural stereotype today. Well, yes, I'm usually the last one to ask. Um, I wonder when you started this uh, use of OpenShift and uh, you discussed with your, with your people on how they will work in, in the future. And you, of course, it, it makes some change into the, how the developers have to behave and how maybe business have to go on. Uh, did you encounter some kind of uh, new issues like, oh, we have been doing this like this before. Why should we now suddenly change? Or was that already uh, clear for everybody what's going to happen when you take this new uh, system into use? Just generally, some thoughts on that. Oh, we're going to make you talk first. <laughs> oh, okay. Auntie, yeah. Um, 
yeah, obviously people have been used to working in a cer certain way. And with the changing cloud environment and cloud-based kind of production model, uh, there have been some some kind of issues that people think the cloud works in a certain way and it then doesn't, and they feel that this is wrong and, and not easy and, and all that. That's why actually we do have the DevOps team at hand, so we try our best to help with these sort of uh, pitfalls before they happen. My key kind of philosophy is that I try to teach people to kind of embrace that things might be broken at some point, so please do engineer your solutions uh, so that they can withstand certain amount of brokenness. Okay, my turn. Uh, I told them to do so, to, so they do it. No, <laughs> actually, uh, we don't. Uh, the development on, developers do development on their own machines. They don't use OpenShift at all, or even containers. They don't build containers. They don't do Docker files. They run JBoss. Sorry, Wildfly in local machine, they run, they run their uh, HTTP server on local machines. Once it goes to Git, then it's container. So developers can do whatever they want as long as it compiles during the build. So it's easy. So there is no cultural like mismatch that now we are developing for OpenShift. No, we are just writing code. We are not developing on OpenShift. Uh, for us, I think there's definitely two things here. Uh, first of all, I was talking about how we're uh, going to make it incremental and easy to get into the open shift. I think that's one critical part. And the second is uh, what Tero was talking about in his presentation about the uh, being the, the champions, having the champions. I think, I guess I'm the dev champion of our company and I think our organization is sufficiently small to the point where I can just go and talk to the people. I know all 15. 15 of us and I can go and show them why it's better than what we currently have. And so I think it's a bit easier than with say 120 people. It's gonna be a challenge with the, the new acquisition though to scale yourself to do that for the next 300. Agreed. Yeah. You might be training, hiring some champions. Yes, <laughs> training champions. Not and hiring. You'll be doing. So that's all the time we have for AMA. Thank you for your questions, much appreciated. Um, and we're gonna now thank our panelists um, for sharing their stories with us and their production use cases and ask them to keep coming back um, and as they change and grow and, and add new things into their projects, um, we'll have them at meetups and upcoming events and we hope to hear from all of you as well um, in the future and so that you'll share your stories too. So thank you and thank you. Thank you.